Any time for questions? Comments? I think, Tim, do you want to handle yourself or do you want me to call people? You can call people. Okay. Um, yeah. <clears throat> My sense is of 1968 in America that it was fueled almost entirely in terms of its broad support. Not that Tom Hayden and others didn't have a whole agenda. But that its broad support was fueled almost entirely by the war. And once the draft ended, the movement essentially disappeared. Plus, there were political actors, Robert Kennedy and Eugene McCarthy, that took the anti-war movement into mainstream politics. But the the basic support that made it widespread was almost exclusively about the war. Do you think that's right? Yeah, I agree. I agree with the first part of the proposition. I think that the war was the great radicalizing force, and I think this was true elsewhere as well. I don't think that people were only rebelling because of their personal stake and being drafted, but I agree with the part that the war was this thing that became, and in a way, it. it um, it sucked up a lot of the oxygen, right? Because the Port Huron statement is not about the war. This war is not really hardly going on yet. It's about you know revitalizing American democracy. It's very much rooted in American values and the Constitution. It's about ending racism. And I think there was a certain feeling on the part of activists that that the war you know hijacked it, and it was important, obviously, but it did. It, it became the, the overwhelming force shaping the activist movement. And the same is true in West Germany, actually. Hi, Alex. Thanks for the talk. You know, you, you, you've been able to, I think, kind of really uh, explain a very complex movement in a, in a, in a really great uh, way. Um, one of the things that I, I've been thinking about is you, you, you kind of talked about this, this idea, right, that, that, uh, that very prevalent in Germany, but I think it exists in some degree in the United States as well, that the 68, you know, kind of succeeds culturally, but they, they fail politically. And I would, it, you were also talking about kind of rep repressive talents. I wonder in which way that actually kind of confirms Marcuse, which is that the left keeps winning culturally, and I, I think even with the setbacks, it, it keeps doing that to this day. But it, it, it's, it keeps retreating on the political, like it, it, it's less and less successful. I, I wonder, um, yeah. That's yeah, I mean, I, I would accept the deployment of Marcuse's repressive tolerance <laughs> in, this, in this situation. Yeah. It just struck me. Yeah. No, no, it's striking. I agree. That's, thanks, Alice. Um, I actually, my questions can go with the previous question and Dr. Zaki's question. Um, I was wondering if you could elaborate on the role of war vis-a-vis uh, -vis the party as an organizing <coughs> principle, the class as an organizing principle in the revolution, because in 1968, in the literature because the 1917 revolution is very much the result of the World War I and the instability. And um, I was also wondering if Marxist approach to revolution uh, as um, if something coming out of base is still correct. And if 1968 was the revolution of the superstructure, the people who, pre uh, who uh, consume the cultural products now want to participate in producing. Yeah, I think that's a legitimate way of looking at 68, mm -hmm. right? Um, but then there's a whole effort to, you know, 68 is characterized by um, neo-Marxist approaches that try to get away from a, a, a you know, pure base superstructure model and try to posit the, you know, the possibility of new actors and also, and they're, they're interested in particular, so like Marx's writings and alienation, which were less important, you know, for the for the whole, but, um, but yeah, I think, and obviously, the war plays a huge role in, in the Bolshevik Revolution, as you say. I mean, the idea had been that uh, the working class, you know, since the worker of the world had no country, according to Marxism, workers would not fight in the imperialist war, and then it was extreme disappointment in the workers' movement that the workers rushed to sign up for the imperialist war. Um, but it did, it did provide the possibility of this revolutionary rupture in Russia. That's exactly right. Also, thank you so much for the talk. I wonder if you could comment on, you mentioned violence at the beginning of the talk, and then talked about the kind of diffusion of 1968s into various 
well, divergences, for example, bottom line of uh, left wing terrorism. And also mentioned the Frankfurt School as a kind of inspiration for some West German activists in 1968. But I'm trying to think a little bit about critical theory and how you're characterizing West German um, movements in 1968. When I think about things like Adorno speaking in Berlin about a Goethean classical play after Ben Olmesor is murdered and the response that the students had to him, the idea of Benjamin's critique of violence and a kind of move in theory toward a definition of ethical violence and a justification for violence. Um, and then fast forwarding a little bit to Habermas and the structural transformation of the public sphere that largely precludes the use of violence in public sphere for politics. It's kind of the, the credential, it's the, it's the agreement that you make when you come to the table. I wonder if you could talk about a little bit about um, violence from the perspective of West German 1968 and fast forwarding to the post-revolutionary, post-materialist world, what the place of violence is right now. Uh, well, um, so, you know, the question of violence for the West German student movement really picks up force when a student, you know, Ernest Horowitz was murdered by the police um, on June 2nd, 1967, uh, in a protest against the Shah of Iran. And, um, you know, Rudy Duchka and other German student leaders um, are in a special issue of Concrete where they discuss the issue of violence. And they're speaking primarily of the possibilities of self-defense or counter-violence. So they, they do not, as someone like Wolfgang Crosshauer tries to claim, uh, you know, position themselves as, uh, you know, like some sort of proto-RAF, right? I think that they're dealing with, a, with again, you know, an age-old revolutionary question. Like, uh, they, you see this in America, too. You protest, if students protest and they're beaten up, and then the students come out the next time with you know, motorcycle helmets to absorb the blows of police clubs, um, this, is, this has its own inexorable logic, right? But the question of, of then creating you know, a, a, a cell that's going to practice violence against the state, like the RAF did, which is predicated on the idea that the state is excellent fascist, um, is, is kind of a, um, you know, you know, a failure of analysis, I would argue, because it's, it's you know, I mentioned earlier the sort of the vulgar Marxist, um, you know, take on the relationship between capitalism and fascism. Um, you know, the RF partakes of this in a way because it's, it thinks that, you know, the state is a fascist state in becoming, and it's ready to become a fascist state, and therefore we need to use preemptive violence against it. Um, and the argument can be made and was made that this breaks, you know, bounds of solidarity from the movement that existed before because the people have to make the either or decision on whether or not to, um, you know, to, to uh, back the RAF. And of course, there's a big scene of sympathizers, and this is a, you know, um, a big deal in, in, um, in German society and letters and also, you know, the filmic representations um, of this period. And so I don't think. I don't think that question of, of whether counter-violence is permissible ever goes away from revolutionary movements. And that there's a, there, that's one position, that's one step along the way and the, and the, the step of um, you know, offensive violence is another step away. And it seems that in all past revolutionary movements, there is a percentage of people who make the claim that the right to that exists. I guess I can just call it people, Mark. I was going to list them. Yeah, so fair. Okay. Hey, first, thank you for the talk. It was really lovely to hear. Um, my question, I have lots of questions, but the one question I wanted to ask you was, uh, must a revolution create a revolution in the government to be considered revolutionary, or can it create revolutionary change in society, social justice movements, and laws? I, I asked this question because one of the absences I was uh, thinking about it I was listening was the interrogation of race and revolution. Not specifically people of color in Germany, although I know they were there and what they were, what they were doing the revolution, but more the conversation about uh, it with corners within the other countries, specifically America, in terms of race in 1960, and how those social justice movements played 
for your mental background and what you pertain. And also how that relates to who is allowed to protest and the optics of how protests are viewed mm -hmm. um, along the line of race, especially the use of who's allowed to use necessary violence or not necessary violence. Right. What was, what was the first point she made, the first part of the question again? Asking you, must a revolutionary movement create a revolution in government to be considered a revolution? Right, or right. Or create revolutionary um, aspects in social justice change society or laws in that government? Right. Yeah, th this is a key question, really. Um, and we actually talked about this a little bit this afternoon when we had a meeting with the Register students because um, many people have claimed, some scholars have claimed, and some former activists have claimed that, you know, we, in the 60s, like Daniel Comendit made this claim 10 years ago when he was in the States to commemorate the 4th anniversary of 68, you know, that we won in the cultural sphere because we produced liberalization, but we lost politically. And he actually went so far as to say, well, it's good that we lost politically because we weren't really going to have, you know, all power to the Soviets and we're going to have all these things that he actually wanted back then, right? And of course, he's a figure of the Green Party, so he's embraced, he, he's embraced uh, you know, like an evolutionary model. But the question of whether, I mean, a lot of the scholarship of the 60s is characterized by the idea that it, it even though it didn't seize power or create an actual revolution with a capital R, it pushed the boundaries in all these areas. And I think that there's something to that because in Germany, for example, um, even though some conservatives in Germany dispute this claim, it's a much, much more liberal country because of the 60s than it would have been otherwise and certainly than it was before, right? Um, so I think sometimes I look at this as a, 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 a sort of a, a couple of poles between <coughs> Um, where, where, let's say, authority is on one side and resistance to authority is on the other side, and there's a wall, and in some historical moments, the wall is pushed very much in the faces of resistance to authority. So authority holds all the cards. And I would say that 60, the 60s and 68 is a moment when the bounds of authority have been stretched very much in the other direction, and then it's, a, it's authority that's on the, um, on the defensive. Um, and in such a moment, then all, there can be lasting gains in all these sort of like social and cultural ways. Um, but it, it doesn't help us solve the question really of whether that's a revolution or not. Do you know what I mean? It's like there can be revolutionary change, but this is, this is a conundrum of 68. Can there be revolutionary change if there isn't actually a revolution? And I, I say the answer is kind of yes, even though that's a partly disappointing answer. <laughs> yes. You, no, you, so, yeah. uh, thank you. Yes. So, as I was listening to you, uh, you know, um, some of the work I've been doing is looked at like how mass culture, mostly like Hollywood film and commemorative journalism, has remembered what 1968 means, which I think is very different kind of narrative in the U.S. than like the historian's version of 1968. And often, sort of spectacular protest events are constructed as a way to. Um, to vilify radical revolutionary movements rather than think about the possibilities of revolution. And so I was curious to know in your own work, as you mentioned briefly, I think some films about, um, about the, like revolutionary movements in Germany or the Beer Meinhof complex. I wondered what you thought about sort of the construction of 68 or the periodization of 68 in yeah. this media context with the kind of history you just gave us. Yeah, well, I would certainly defer to Marco on the German films, but I can say as a general observation that um, I agree with you that filmic portrayals of the 60s are, in the States, are very much, have very much been designed to disempower positive memories of the counterculture and the student movement. Um, you think of a movie like Forrest Gump, right? <laughs> so like, the, you know, the, 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 you know, the radicals and girlfriend beater, right? That Forrest Gump has to, you know, so like the, these kind of depictions are legion in the, in the filmic portrayals of 68 in the States. And there's a whole literature in the cultural politics of memory with regard to 68, not just in, not just in the States, but in Europe as well. Um, there's a really good volume edited by Ingo Corneals and Sarah Waters that came out like 10 years ago, I think, where they 
they discuss the politics of memory in all the European cases. I don't think in the States, but anyway, I, just, I agree this is an important issue. Yes? Yeah, um, and speaking of, of films and cultural um, portrayals after the fact, what would you say, to this, since you mentioned the Society of the Spectacle, what would you say to an argument that maybe the entire student movement um, really accomplished nothing in really changing um, some of the real, this, this you know, group structure maybe, but nothing of the real political structure of the countries, perhaps because of its isolation from the working class and lack of interest in engaging with a lot of workers, and that perhaps all it really did was create things like Rolling Stone magazine in America, or um, you know, left-wing rock and roll, or whatever, like Gang of Four in Britain later in the 70s, you know, or something like that. But that really, it was, um, it was just a cultural shift that had, it, that did have many um, positive outcomes, as a uh, gentleman said earlier. Um, we've seen, you know, a lot of the things that they were fighting for as far as the women's movement, uh, LGBT rights, all these sorts of things that have come out later, but living standards are now far, far lower in America and for most workers in, in the world. So what would you say to the argument that really it actually changed nothing and that it was sort of on the level of just making the spectacle more liberal, as you said, that, that Germany, for one example, uh, became more liberal because of the 60s? And yeah. I'm sorry, if I can pile on since that was my question from earlier, like there's a way in which the, uh, it, you know, to say that the, the, the cultural side of this succeeded kind of that brings us back to the question as surely one of the, 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 the responsibilities that a, a, a cultural um, movement is to be able to imagine new possibilities and that they succeeded in kind of, you know, arguing for radical equalities in many ways, but then they they, they failed to get us to this moment where we can't even imagine the end of capitalism, right? That that's one way in which the cultural imagination seems to have failed, right? That, that we keep talking about cult, cultural and political, but we haven't actually brought up like economic explicitly, and that's, that's where that, you know, the, the cultural movement should be helping in that imaginary, and that part of the imaginary has not come through. Yeah. Well, I guess, in a way, they did imagine the end of capitalism, right? But, you know, you, you guys are familiar with the concept of recuperation, right? Like, capitalism has to recuperate itself. It has to heal from its wounds. And I would say it certainly healed from its 60s wounds. And one of the ways that it healed from its 60s wounds was by something I didn't get to talk about in this talk, but it's the problem of, of, um, of you know, the, the revolution being the revolution being packaged and sold back to its adherents, right? And in my book, I talk extensively over many chapters about all the ways in which radicals complain about the fact that the revolution is being turned into products to buy and sold back to them, and they struggle mightily against this, right? Um, so that aspect of capitalism is very um, vibrant, it's very it's robust, and if you don't actually have a plan for what would come out, like they could imagine the end of capitalism, but I don't think they imagined how the end of capitalism would come. Now, as to the question of whether or not, you know, I wouldn't say that it's all a spectacle because they objectively made Germany more liberal. They objectively paved the way for the rise of the Greens and the fact that, you know, like Marco and I were talking earlier about how, the, how in Germany there's kind of no one who isn't a Green, right? They all accept that common thing. That's partly an outcome of 68. Um, but I'm a little bit sympathetic to the argument that they didn't have the right tools or come up with the right strategies for doing what they wanted to do. And that's why it's tricky because there's all these multiple, there's these, all these different approaches to what it could be and that they couldn't agree about it. And I'm not sure it's possible to agree about it. Like, I'm not sure it's possible. There's many people who made the claim that you were sort of alluding to that maybe we need to connect with the working class. And all these cog group and these little communist groups, they took that very seriously, even to the point of, in one in the copy of AML, they told the members that they should quit looking like hippies and they should cut their hair, so, because that's a strategy of capitalism to, to drive a wedge between the young generation of workers and the older generation of workers, um, and um, so that they should be able to be, you know, to, to be a unitary working class. But, um, yeah, I mean, I don't have an answer to this. Yes? I'm thinking particularly of the May 68 
um, revolution in, in Paris. And, you know, in 1988, I was living in France, and I took part in demonstrations on the streets of my little town in Bologna in France. Um, and then moving forward into 2005 with the riots in Saint-Denis and the Banlieue, and how um, these things kind of fit together, that France is going through this crisis of national identity right now, uh, particularly with the rise of the La Famille Le Pen, and then, um, and then the rise of Macron, um, with this new French, you know, <coughs> uh, that seems to be leaving out questions of the Bonga and the people who, you know, are really going to be the, the fomenters and the, the beneficiaries of, of a revolution that will, you know, really turn over the, the authoritarianism of French identity. And I kind of see that happening in France, and I see it happening in the United States, too, where there is this real redefinition of what it is to be American and what it is to be French. And I was wondering if you can talk about how revolution kind of follows this interesting trajectory of redefinition of, of what it is to be something, what it is to be a revolutionary, what it is to be French, what it is to be American, what it is to be German, if you could maybe address that. Yeah, I can't say too much to the problem other than to say that that each new, you know, putatively revolutionary generation has its own issues and its new problems, right? The situation always changes. What I'm noticing now is that even though identity is extremely important in the way she just described, class is coming back onto the agenda in a way that it hasn't before. And this is partly an outcome of the recent electoral, electoral campaign that was happening before on the basis of empirical analysis of workers' wages and things like that. Um, so I, I guess I, I guess I feel a little old left about the class issue, right? Like I think that that needs to be, I think that needs to be, I think in, in classical Marxism there isn't a, um, an op there shouldn't be an opposition between issues of who gets along as a citizen and <coughs> how the pie is cut up, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think there has to be that opposition, and I don't think there is necessarily on behalf of militants um, who are working in these areas. Um, but the ground is quite different now in the way that you describe. Yes? Um, my question was, uh, uh, um, what about the 1968, the challenges of the 1968 desire, right, if, uh, today? Right? What has changed in the process? Right? I, I mean, 1968 being, a, as you said, like a, a multi-issue desire for different possible worlds. Um, and you mentioned Occupy, I, I, I would add there Black Lives too, that has a symbiotic relation. I, I think, but what are the challenges of, my, of, of that desire in the neoliberal age? What has changed, to, just to extend that a little bit? And, and just a quick thing, uh, thinking 1968 uh, as a sort of failure, um, um, it's like thinking that the, 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 the brain can be a failure, or that wind can be a failure. You know? I mean, it was a, a, a collective global desire, extremely pluralistic, uh, sort of like a need of the species in the process. You know? um, um, so, uh, but, but definitely, the material <laughs> conditions under neoliberalism with climate change too has changed, right? So, what 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 are the new challenges that neoliberalism represents for for that for that um, society? Yeah. Well, I mean, the challenge. I guess one challenge is to it, well, here now. Um, it's a whole can of worms. So, one challenge is to break with liberalism. Right? Because liberalism has hitched itself so much to the to the wagon of neoliberalism, to hypercapitalism, that it's impossible to seek any sort of revolutionary change within the fold of liberalism. The best liberalism, and liberalism doesn't even have a program for dealing with the radical right. We see that right now. They're, they're completely incapable. They're transfixed like a deer in the headlights at the at the you know at the sight of what's going on. Right? In different countries, not just the states. Um, and you know, liberal. There was a moment in this moment of prosperity in the post-war period, in the last century, where liberalism could seem to be coterminous with, like, literally the Great Society, right? But at the same time, it's carrying out the Vietnam War. So we can, people could have different opinions about the value of liberalism as a historical movement. But liberalism has always been, since the 19th century, deeply connected to capital. It's always been 
a movement that, you know, going back to the French Revolution, liberalism wants a career of the talents, right? They want the, you know, the people to be able to, to do their thing, make their money, and it's always striven to exclude the lower classes. This is true in 1848, it's true throughout the, 19th, throughout the 20th century. Um, and there's a moment in which it tries to include, in some level, um, in, in the States and also in Europe. We have welfare societies, but they've been systematically dismantled. So, that would be my short answer to this question. Yes? Um, I hope this is an silly question. I'm, I, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about differences. Um, so, so you're talking about 1968, you talked a lot about France and about Germany. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about this time of transition after Franco dies in Spain. Um, so you talked about the civil war in Spain um, and that kind of split. But then, um, you know, Spain is sort of in a different place where it's left with fascism, right, for a much longer time than other places in Europe. And it isn't until Franco's death in 1975 that the country finally gets to sort of breathe, but no one knows what direction to go in. And so um, sort of the more student movement, which we also see happen a little bit, you know, at, at a different time, right, because of that. And also the way in which they're engaging is different, right? And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about those, those differences. Sure. Well, I mean, I can't claim great expertise on Franco's Spain and the suit movements within them, but I can say that there's a bunch of new scholarship uh, happening right now from graduate students and others who are working on, um, on tracing the twin um, streams of student radicalism, even as early in the 60s, while Franco's still around, mm -hmm. and the, the Western counterculture into Spain, and showing how that it was at work there even then, right? But Spain, like Greece, is on this kind of different timeline from Central and Western Europe, um, and um, also also anarchist movements remain in, in, during this period, you know, and this is a whole um, you know, there's that book, Brandy Made Me an Anarchist, in that book by Stuart Christie, where he, he's a, the Welsh militant who, who, who gets recruited by the Spanish anarchists to try to assassinate Franco. So he goes to Spain and tries to assassinate Franco, and somehow he survives, isn't killed, is thrown in prison, and he makes it back to the UK, writes his memoir, and so on. But I think this is a particularly interesting way that it shows these transnational linkages, even under the dictatorship, right? Um, but I don't, I don't have a lot of observations to make about Spain other than the rudimentary ones that I just made. Thank you for the question. Yes? This is an intriguing poster. You've got the two texts going on here, the verbal and the visual. And the verbal is a return to normality or normalcy. And the visual is not a very subtle, subliminal suggestion because these aren't just sheep. They're male sheep, they're rams. And so a return to normalcy is a return to the patriarchy and all its egregiousness. Would you not agree? Yeah, I would. To Gaulism. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And thank you for this. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. You're very welcome. Okay, thank you, Shirt. And here at 7 o'clock, thank you for all the questions. That was great. Thanks, Tim.